hi everyone thank you so much uh for being with us we're just gonna we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes um and let people trickle in but please feel free to start introducing yourselves um if you want to say your name um and where you're um where you're tuning in from in the chat it'd be great to get a sense of who we have in the room with us I'm Caroline, <laughs> and I live in San Diego. I'm a member of uh, the DSA San Diego branch, but I'm currently tuning in from Prague. Oh, wow. My best friend's in Prague. <laughs> really? Do they live Do they live here or they're wow, visiting? Wow, it's just his favorite city to go visit. It's funny. Wow, that is really cool. <laughs> What time is it in Prague? 2 a.m. Oh, <laughs> So when I first saw this event, I thought, well, I can't do it because it's so late. But as it turns out, I'm terribly jet lagged and I haven't been able to sleep. So I was like, ah, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to get settled with this dog. <laughs> Oh, lots of people. Good. <coughs> Oops, I didn't do that. Hi, Nicole and Michelle and Clyde just saying hi. Hey, Michelle and Clyde. Great to see both of you. Happy to have you with us. Maybe we can go ahead and get started because I think um, we've got a really packed packed um, hour ahead of us. <laughs> um, but um, I'm just gonna make it so that we have our security on. Um, so, oh, hi everybody. Just a quick note that this event will also be recorded. So please keep your camera off if you are um, uncomfortable with that. Um, but otherwise, it's an honor to have you with us today on the one year anniversary of Bell Hooks passing. Um, we're here to commemorate the inimitable legacy of one of the most radical and innovative thinkers and activists of our lifetimes. Bell is well known for her writings on race, class, feminism, and intersectionality. Um, but in DSA's Religion and Socialism group, we agreed that the centrality of spirituality to Bell's legacy is sometimes neglected. Um, Bell wrote about the way that feelings of despair about the state of the world could be avoided through love, um, and that spirituality and the spiritual life are what give us the strength to do just that. Her study of spiritual teachings served as her, quote, guide for reflection and action. And she attests that the wisdom found in spiritual teachings are what kept her from hardening her heart. The earliest roots of Bell's spiritual practice were in the Christian tradition, and she found in the church a place for worship and fellowship. But she also actively participated in a Buddhist practice marked by prayer and meditation. Quote, among progressive thinkers and scholars, she wrote, it was much more hip, cool, and acceptable to express atheistic sentiments than to declare passionate devotion to divine spirit. This is from All About Love. But Bell found in spirituality a sense of refuge and stated that her belief in God as love was what sustained her. Um, as many of you know, again, Bell passed away um, one year ago today, and it is such an honor to have with us Larissa Harrington, Dr. George Yancey, and Dr. Carolyn jones Medin to guide us through different aspects of Bell's thought that are each foundational to her legacy. Each of our panelists is going to give a short presentation before we open the floor up for questions and discussion. Um, and if you have a question or a contribution, you're welcome to just write it in the chat um, or you can raise your hand to ask it yourself um, when the time comes. Um, but first, a little bit about our speakers. Uh, Larissa Harrington is a third year doctoral student in systematic theology at the University of Notre Dame from Illinois. She holds bachelor degrees in psychology and social work from Greenville University and is a graduate of Emory University's Candler School of Theology, where she completed her Master of Divinity, concentrating in Catholic studies. Her current areas of research include the role of Mary in devotional and popular piety, womanist theology, 
eschatology as it relates to the historical and contemporary con conditions of diasporic Africans, ritual studies, and sacramental theology. Overall, she is interested in how all of these areas converge in the lives of African American and Afro Latinx Catholics in the United States, the Caribbean, and Latin America. Carolyn M. Jones Medine is the All Shall Be Well Professor of Religion in the Religion Department and a Professor and Director of the Institute for African American Studies at the University of Georgia. She writes on many things, including the writings of her teacher, um, African American historian of religions, Charles H. Long, um, but in her work on bell hooks, Jen Willis, Charles Johnson, and others, is thinking about the Black Buddhist experience. Her entry, African American and Womanist Buddhist Thought was published in the Routledge Handbook of Buddhist Christian Studies, edited by Carolyn Anderson and Thomas Katoy in 2022. Um, and finally, George Yancey is a Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Philosophy at Emory University and a Montgomery Fellow at Dartmouth College, one of the college's highest honors. He is also the University of Pennsylvania's inaugural fellow in the Provost Distinguished Faculty Fellowship Program. He works primarily in the areas of critical philosophy of race, critical whiteness studies, critical phenomenology, especially on racial embodiment, and philosophy of the Black experience. George is the author, editor, and co-editor of over 20 books, and including Black Bodies, White Gazes, Look a White, Backlash, What Happens When We Talk Honestly About Racism in America, Across Black Spaces, Essays and Interviews from an American Philosopher, Critical Perspectives on Bell Hooks, and Black Men from Behind the Veil, which was published this year. At Academic Influence, Yancey is cited as one of the top 10 influential philosophers in the last 10 years. He has also published over 200 combined scholarly articles, chapters, and interviews that have appeared in professional journals, books, and at various news sites. He is well known for his influential essays and interviews at the New York Times, philosophy column, The Stone, and at the prominent political website, Truth Out. Yancey is currently working on several book projects, and lastly is the Philosophy of Race book series editor at Lexington Books. So as you can, as you can see, we have some amazing um, panelists with us to guide us through some aspects of Bell's legacy. Um, and so without further ado, we'll begin with Larissa. Thank you so much, Nicole Ann, for um, that lovely introduction and for this invitation. I'm so excited to um, share my um, thoughts with you today about um, Hook's legacy and life. My first introduction to her actually was through the study of theology, religion, and spirituality. So um, I think it's only fitting that as a student of theology um, that I should come to her in that way. So um, today I just want to talk about um, the gift that um, Bell gave me as a Black woman, um, which is incorporated into like a, a significant piece that she wrote early in her career. And so I would say that the gift that Bell Hooks gave me as a Black woman is the reclaiming, is reclaiming the power of the pen and reclaiming the power of voice over the oppressive worlds of silence and marginalization. So in her essay, when I was a young soldier for the revolution, coming to voice, she explores this idea of the evolution of the voice, which she describes as occurring throughout various stages across one's lifespan. So this is a quote from that article, which I really love. However, for women within oppressed groups who have contained so many feelings, despair, rage, anguish, who do not speak, as poet Audre Lorde writes, quote, for fear our words will not be heard nor welcomed, end quote. Coming to voice is an act of resistance. Speaking becomes both a way to engage in active self-transformation and it becomes a rite of passage where one moves from being an object to being a subject. Only as subjects can we speak. As objects, we remain voiceless. Our beings defined and interpreted by others. So I think what's 
important to remember about this sentiment is that when we find and come to voice, it is not one univocal voice that we have for the rest of our lives. Bell is adamant that voice evolves. Voice has to necessarily change based on the data and the life experiences that we have of the entire world. So this is gonna bring us to another poignant point from that essay, which is the idea that poetry is transcendent speech. Poetry itself is spirituality, it is spiritual. It connects us to the divine essence that is at the center of all being. It is the place she says for the secret voice. So when I think about this, when I think about poetry as transcendent speech, I think about the book of Psalms and the Bible, which is a collection of Hebrew poetry. But I also think about my own upbringing as a black woman in the Midwest and the various traumas I've endured throughout my life in the form of racism, microaggressions, and other types of difficult upbringings, you know, growing up in poverty. And I remember that poetry for me became a lifeline when I was not able to speak, when my voice was taken away from me by forces beyond my control and by people who didn't know how to love and care for me properly. And actually, when I was asked to do this presentation, I remembered, and it was a lovely memory, that I wrote an anthology of poetry when I was 16 years old to get through some of those hardest moments of my life. And what's really interesting about this is that that 15-year-old voice, that 16-year-old voice that is recorded in that anthology, obviously, right, has similarities and continuity with the voice I now possess yet they are different voices. I see growth, maturity, expansion, and a self-awareness, I would say a spirituality, a consciousness that wasn't there before. And that all sounds nice, right? Fine and dandy in theory, but it's important that Bell wants to warn against the commodification of the voice. And I think that's something that we have to take away from her essays on voice and self-transformation, we have to protect the voice, specifically the voices of Black women, she says, which for Black women, the voice is really a pilgrimage. It's a journey into self-expression, and it's a journey into the heart of liberation itself. And what happens often is that this journey, this pilgrimage actually becomes a tool of capital where it is monetized. And she says, when we do this, when we take someone's spiritual liberative journey into the heart of the self, right? This is supposed to be a spiritual transformative experience that actually heals the soul of the, the woundedness that is there. When we do this, we actually perpetuate cycles of marginalization and disempowerment all over again. Thus, it's really important for her that we guard against the monetization and commodification of a process that was meant to actually liberate us. So coming to voice is actually meant to encourage healing at a much deeper spiritual level that academia does not offer us. And this is why this concept cannot remain purely academic. This actually has to become, um, she used this in All About Love. Um, she describes love as the ultimate sacrament. It has to become sacramental. It has to become something that we do to actually deepen our spiritual lives and to connect back to that divine source that you know is the source of all being. And so something that I fear that Bell's work on voicing that we may not appreciate in its fullest or entirety is that this all sounds good in theory, but when your life is actually on the line, when your life is at stake, this means something entirely different, right? 
And she actually says this at the end of the essay, and I think this is what I would like to end with. Um, she gives a story. She tells a story about having taught women and courses she taught on feminism throughout her career. And she specifically rec um, recalls the tale of a woman who came from um, a country overseas where speaking could literally result in punishment, criminalization, and or penalization. And so for this woman, there were real consequences to speaking up and speaking out against certain injustices that she had faced in her country of origin. And so what does Hooks advocate? She encourages the women in the class and that one student in particular who said, you know, Dr. Dr. Hooks, I'm just so afraid. I'm just so afraid to speak out and to speak up, but I'm also afraid when I'm silent. And so what does she do in good bell hooks fashion? She cites Audre Lorde, fellow black sister in arms. And she says to that student to speak up anyway, knowing that you were never meant to survive. Obviously, I know that to some of you that might sound harsh, like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So speak anyway, but I want to encourage us to sit with the challenge of this sentiment that she has at the end of the essay, because I think it's true. I think it's fundamentally true. If any of you are familiar with the, this popular meme, I'm a millennial, so I like memes. If you're familiar with this popular meme where the person is holding two pills in their hand and the little subtext reads, hard life pills to swallow. Um, this is one of those hard life pills to swallow especially for marginalized persons. This is one of those hard life pills to swallow. People of color have had to learn historically and in the contemporary world, women especially, that we were not meant to survive in a world like ours. It wasn't built for us. It wasn't built to occupy space for our voice and our being. Thus, we can embrace the practice of speaking with courage, and a tenacity because we know that no matter what we do, the world wasn't built for people like us. And by exercising that virtue of courage, we open the door for other women and other people to reclaim the most intimate parts of themselves. So that is the gift that Belle has given me as a Black woman. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Larissa. That was um, incredible. And I really love what you said about poetry and um, poetry as a form of spirituality and poetry as a lifeline. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, just moving along, um, now we're going to have Dr. Uh, Carolyn jones Medin. All right. That was beautiful. Thank you, Larissa. <clears throat> I'm a little under the weather, folks, so <laughs> Hang, just bear with me. Um, there's so much I'd love to say about bell hooks, but I wanted to start with a quotation that Nicole Ann already referred to from All About Love. My belief that God is love, that love is everything, our true destiny sustains me. I affirm these beliefs through daily meditation and prayer, through contemplation and service, through worship and loving kindness. This is true for all Bell Hooks undertook as a thinker and religious practitioner. Her Christian Buddhist practice informed by the beat poets Thich Nhat Hanh and other Buddhist teachers, as well as Martin Luther King Jr., her black feminist commitments and her work as a scholar and a poet were all guided by this love. Coming to Buddhism to find a way out of her own suffering and despair in the same way she discovered and thought about theory Hooks imagined a world beyond the imperialist, capitalist, white supremacist, cis patriarchy in which we live, so that we Black folk could come to love ourselves and one another, and so that all of us could think, rethink, and rejoin community, starting with home place. Like Hooks, I grew up in a segregated community, so I get what she means by home place as a site that interrogates the death-dealing quality of our culture. I think her multiple commitments help to identify the shortcomings of each individual path and to make some poetic thing, what Sylvia Winter would call engaging in the poetic overturn that touches 
and I use a Buddhist idea here, and engages something beyond the limits of the rational enlightenment mind. This was clear for my generation in the way that she addressed teaching and learning. I won't say more about this now, but she confirmed to my generation of professors that our instinct was right, that we had to enter the classroom in a different mode, that we couldn't be like the usually white paterfamilias who formed us. But here, I just wanna talk a little bit about the elements of Hook's, Hook's love ethic as my contribution. Love for Hooks begins with the self, though the self should not be an endless project because that gets us caught in the error, error of thinking we are independent essential selves. We have to begin with the individual practicing love because it is, it is there that we can experience firsthand love's transformative power. Only self-love lets us enter community in a vital way, deploying the elements of love to act rightly, ethically, and morally for others, to engage in metta, the desire for all beings to be happy, and karuna, compassion or active sympathy that bears the suffering of the other. Loving kindness is a force in detaching from our own suffering. It's the antidote to selfishness, anger, and fear. So love for hooks is not primarily a feeling. It's an art and a practice of freedom with self-love as a basis. It's not magical. For Hooks, love does not bring an end to difficulties. It gives us the strength to cope with difficulties in a constructive way. Love is a voluntary practice, a practice of sustained love and care that involves accountability and responsibility, as well as all the dimensions of love, which she utilizes from Eric Fromm, care, commitment, trust, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. These elements reveal that love is a skillful means, a basis for action that can be used to bring Christian Buddhist teachings to particular situations. The practice of love makes us mindful and aware so as to examine our actions and to grow in the practice of love. Hooks writes that when we commit to love in our daily life, habits are shattered because we no longer are playing by the safe rules of the status quo. Love moves us to a new ground of being. In an imperialist, capitalist, white supremacist, cis patriarchy society, love, which lies at the heart of all religions, Hooks argues, is countercultural. Hooks is clear what love is not. To put it baldly, for Hooks, self esteem is not love. Materialistic hedonism is not love. Black people, any people who worship money, are not interested in a love ethic. Capitalist achievement, getting rich, is not about love and neither does achievement contribute necessarily to collective well-being. Imitating normative culture, absorbing its values and try to live, live, live that way of life deflects from love. When especially black folks seek what Melanie Harris, Helen Ree and I call approximate whiteness, we enter, internalize and exercise to the degrees that we can, white critical consciousness and we do damage to ourselves and others. Cooperation with white supremacist culture, therefore, blocks how we see ourselves and, our, and it blocks our true paths to humanity. So we need a practice. I define practice as a patterned activity that aligns mind, body, and spirit in the doing of it. As Hooks writes in All About Love, a commitment to spiritual practice requires conscious practice, a willingness to unite the way we think with the way we act. What matters is how we live. So what are the elements of her practice? One, we begin with the self because the self is what we have at hand and because what we do for ourselves, we will do for others. This involves mindfulness and love of the neighbor. Second, above all, we must give up participating in power and domination which prevent persons from living free and fully and well. As a Franciscan, I think of this as working to give up all the options to oppress in which we can engage. Instead, we should cultivate a, cultivate a commitment to honor, honor interbeing such that we cannot bear the suffering of the other and that we seek to free the other. Third, a love ethic means recognizing and celebrating the presence of transcendent spirits, whatever we name them. Love is our source, hooks as firm as I began in her belief that God is love and that love is everything. She was, as I am, particularly devoted to and celebratory of the angels. We must engage spiritual teachers. Spiritual teachers like Martin Luther King Jr. though should not be admired for their personalities, but how they help us get back to, to as Thich Nhat Hanh describes King's power, 
the ability to touch the true teacher within, in other words, to, to the self. We should participate in fellowship and community, fifth, with like-minded others chosen based on a belief that honesty, openness, and personal integrity need to be expressed in both public and private decisions. We need a Sangha. Community hooks suggest should be organized around love, cultivating care, respect, and the will to cooperate. As Thich Nhat Hanh tells Bell Hooks, community is also a site of ongoing cleaning. Um, in that cleaning, we're reminded to apply our insights alive about love and justice in every speech, every word, and every act. Such participation helps to re us to remember when we face those who want to make enemy that we enter our, even with them. A love ethic means addressing our anger, especially as people of color. And we need to hear this in America at this moment. We are living in an enraged culture. We really are. It is sick. If we cannot deal with our anger, the nightmare escalates and escalates an anger, which points us to the reality that something's wrong, turns into hatred, which is a poison. We, Hooks argues, oppress ourselves by holding on to anger. We must embrace our anger, interrogate it, find the skillful means to use it, and let it go. We've got to let it go. And finally, we must know that this work is ongoing because suffering is ongoing. As Hooks learned from Thich Nhat Hanh, we have to turn suffering into compost. It can become the abundant waste that we use to make new growth possible. No mud, no lotus. I just wanted to close by saying that, that Hook's love ethic is incredibly demanding. It calls us to a habit of love that stands in creative tension with imperialist, white, racist, capitalist society. We must begin by recognizing that love indeed is a power, and it's a power that can talk back, making what John Lewis called good trouble with outrage but with dignity and, what, and with fierce compassion, standing in equanimity that can resist with tenacity. A practice of love teaches us, as Hooks put it in one of her poems, to draw up powers from the deep, to bring about that healing that is so needed, so desired, and so long deferred. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Johnson Dean. That was um, that was amazing. I just love the different elements of um, Bell's love practice, um, or um, um, that you kind of that you elucidated, specifically um, its relationship to freedom. Um, and I hope we can start to um, delve into that a little bit more in the question and answer um, session. But um, I guess finally, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Yancey, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Excellent. Okay, well, um, talk about a conceptual family resemblance. I have to say thanks to uh, Larissa and Carolyn for uh, laying the foundation because some of this, I mean, we're just overlapping here in a really productive way. So I appreciate that. But it's, but it's not redundant, right? It's just reinforcing over again. Uh, so let me thank my fellow panelists uh, for sharing this space as we address who I consider to have been uh, indeed a deep friend of mine, Bell Hooks. Uh, let me also thank Nicole uh, Ann uh, for inviting me and for Ralph McCoy for being instrumental in this process. I'm deeply appreciative. Um, and I'll just look at my notes. I'm not going to look up much. I, I had to significantly cut this back because it was just too long. So I apologize for that. The question that the three of us have been tasked with um, addressing is what is a foundational idea via from Bell Hooks that you believe is vital to her? legacy. I'm so glad that the question begins with the indefinite article A as opposed to the definite article the or the. I say this because I don't think that I could give the foundational or the foundational as opposed to a foundational idea for Bell Hooks that I believe is vital to her legacy. I say this because Bell Hooks work, her life project, is so multifaceted, so rhizomatic, eclectic, and multidisciplinary. However, there is a theme or concept or an overarching framework that powerfully functions as a strut or girder that informs Bell's writing, practice, and her identity. That I believe to be her understanding and practice of love spirituality. 
But before I address, address this, let me bring attention to the root meaning of the word legacy that appears in the question that we're here to address. The term legacy originally comes from a Latin word, which means ambassador or envoy. It is here then that I would argue that bell hooks is an ambassador or envoy or messenger of love and spirituality. When addressed within the context of her braided concept, imperialist white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, it is clear to me that Bell sees love spirituality as a powerful set of tools, powerful sites and practices for undoing the horror, injustice and hatred of imperialist white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Each of these terms, imperialism, white supremacy, capitalism and patriarchy speak to forms of hegemonic violence, oppression, structural violence, forms of ontological truncation, existential, social, and psychic despair, necrophilia, death and dying. In short, if love, spirituality constitutes a site of freedom, then imperialism, white supremacist capitalism, and patriarchy speak to modes of unfreedom, modes of disempowerment, modes of subordination, and modes of inculcating deep fear and trepidation. I would argue that Bell Hooks, in her courageous practice to talk back, with love and spirituality was a revolutionary figure. As we know, Bell honored the work of Paulo Freire, who powerfully critiqued what he called the banking system of education, which I believe encourages so many of us to sleepwalk. That is, those who are afraid to risk, where risk is so important to Bell's understanding of love and spirituality. For Freire, dialogue is existential. It is a site of freedom and agency. Freire writes, quote, I am more and more convinced that true revolutionaries must perceive the revolution because of its creative and liberating nature as an act of love, end quote. My sense is that Bell understood true love, true spirituality as liberatory, creative and revolutionary. For Bell, love spirituality involves what I would call a process of unsuturing. It is an opening, what Edward Glissant might call a process of quote unquote, prizing me open. After all, how can one be maximally revolutionary, liberatory and creative within contexts that are designed to suffocate acts of freedom, suffocate acts of love that are designed to reject deception, hypocrisy, lies, and simulacra? Bell Hooks understood this freedom early in her life. She writes, quote, when I was a young girl, I would lie in my attic bed and talk endlessly with divine spirit about the nature of love. Like Jacob wandering alone by the stream in the stillness of my pitch dark room, I grappled with the metaphysics of love, seeking to understand life's mystery. Now I recognize that I was engaged from then until now in a disciplined spiritual practice, opening the heart. It led me to become a devout seeker on love's path, to talk with angels face to face, unafraid." End quote. Imagine Belle as a young black girl talking endlessly, which itself is a process of letting go. Also notice the importance that the young Belle understood vis-a-vis -vis solitude. Perhaps this was a place where she got to escape the seductive chatter of the world. Most of us, I am sure, are afraid of solitude, are afraid of what we might discover. Perhaps some aspect of ourselves that we have been fleeing, some aspect of ourselves that isn't quite beautiful. Yet, as a young, at a young age, Bell already knew that solitude is not a place of fear, but a place to reside, to tarry within. It is a place where we face ourselves with courage and honesty. It is the opposite of the river called Lethe in Hades, which is a place where we forget or where we are unmindful. Rather, Bell is talking about a place where Aletheia, the Greek for truth, occurs as an event where an unconcealed open of ourselves, where there is an exposure to the truth, where we remain mindful. This exposure is how love works. Bell writes, quote, to know love, we have to tell the truth to ourselves and to others. Creating a false self to mask fears and insecurities has become so common that many of us forget who we are and what we feel underneath the pretense. Breaking through the, this denial is always the first step, step in uncovering our longing to be honest and clear. End quote. To let the lies go, to demask, to challenge the pretense is precisely an act of spiritual practice. I recall clearly when trying to call Bell on her phone and not getting her, there was that powerful message that said, quote, all awakening 
to love is spiritual awakening, end quote. Notice the link that Bell makes between awakening to love and spiritual awakening. For Bell, this form of love has nothing to do with Hollywood. It is, as James Baldwin says, a removal of the mask that we fear we cannot live without, and yet we cannot live within. It is a love that is not sentimental. It is a form of love that is indicative of growing up, of facing the fragility of love. Love, in short, for Bell, is a form of giving, a form of release. It is not an isolated process that takes place within an isolated Cartesian mental theater, but reaches for the other. Bell Hooks writes, the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth. Love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely, of, of, of will, namely both an intention and an action. Will also implies choice. We do not have to love, we choose to love, end quote. It is this process of choosing that is so powerful, especially as it requires standing in the face of uncertainty, precarity, practicing, practicing vulnerability, and opening oneself to be wounded. Yet isn't this what spirituality looks like in action? An openness to be touched by the other, whether the other is another human being or by the divine or perhaps the earth? Spirituality within this context is a grounding practice, a healing practice. Discussing spirituality within the context of her students, Bell Hooks writes, quote, I talk about spirituality more now than ever before because I see my students suffering more than ever before. And, it, and it's amazing how spirituality grounds them, end quote. As stated already, Bell Hooks is an ambassador, a messenger of love and spirituality, which means that she talked back with righteous indignation to dominant structures, ideologies, and practices that are designed to kill the human spirit. Within this context, Bell is the quintessential parhesiastes, the one who engages in courageous speech. In our contemporary moment where the difference between truth and lies is obfuscated, where neoliberalism is worshiped as a god, where toxic forms of populism and demagoguery abound, Bell's voice is absolutely quintessentially necessary. She reminds us, quote, in today's world, we are encouraged to see honest people as naive, as potential losers, bombarded with cultural propaganda, ready to instill in all of us the notion that lies are more important, that truth does not matter. We are all potential victims. Consumer culture in particular encourages lies. Keeping people in a constant state of lack, in perpetual desire, strengthens the marketplace economy. Lovelessness is a boon to consumerism and lies strengthens the world of predatory advertising. Commitment to knowing love can protect us by keeping us wedded to a life of truth, willing to share ourselves openly and fully in both private and public life." End quote. I would argue that for Bell, imperialist, white, supremacist, capitalist patriarchy is structurally anathema to love and spirituality. While feminism was an indispensable set of, of anti-hegemonic practices that guided her life. After all, she defines feminism as a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation and oppression. Bell Hooks was clear regarding what was fundamental. In an engaging interview uh, for the New York Times, where I interviewed Bell, she said to me, quote, feminism does not ground me. It is the discipline that comes from spiritual practice that is the foundation of my life. If we talk about what discipline, what a disciplined writer I have been and hope to continue to be, that discipline starts with a spiritual practice. It's just every day, every day, every day, end quote. It is her practice, not just identity as a Buddhist Christian that grounds her worldview, her vision of the world as one fully engaged in love and spiritual practice. In a small book entitled All Divine Love, prayers for now and always, Bell writes, quote, prayer is a space of reckless abandonment. When we tell all to a listening God who will not judge, whenever my faith has been shaken, prayer is my anchor. In conversation with God, I renew my spirit, end quote. Two more paragraphs and that's it. Isn't, isn't it this hopefulness that Bell brought to bear on her teaching, which she linked with the sacred and spirituality? She writes, quote, to educate as the practice of freedom comes easiest to those of us who teach, who also believe that there is an aspect of our vocation that is sacred, who believe that our work is not merely to share information, 
but to share in the intellectual and spiritual growth of our students, end quote. My sense is that Bell engaged pedagogy critically as a way to foster liberation. It was an act of love where she got her where she got to bear witness to our capacity, our collective capacity for transcendence, which is linked to freedom and resistance as resistere, which means to take a stand. For Bell, anger is not reckless or irrelevant to love, but in fact, generative. She was fond of telling this story where she says, quote, the first time that I got to be with Thich Nhat Hanh, I had just been longing to meet him. I was like, I'm going to meet this incredibly holy man. On the day that I was going to, to meet him, um, I stepped off, sorry, to meet him. I was going to meet him incredibly, da, 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 da. Every step of the way, I felt that I was encountering some kind of racism or sexism. When I got to him, the first thing out of my mouth was, I am so angry. And he, of course, Mr. Calm himself, Mr. P said, well, you know, hold on to your anger and use it as compost for your garden, end quote. Within this context, there is a place for anger, a place where anger can be redirected, an emptying where anger doesn't have the last word. For Bell, home ought to be, as it were, the last word, a place of safety. She writes, quote, so many black males and females have suffered mental abandonment and more than police brutality. That's the core of many of us. That is the core for many of us of our trauma, end quote. In short, Bell recognizes the weight of black vulnerability in a country that often leaves us feeling homeless, where our wounds go unattended and unrecognized. Home is an important site where love, healing flourishes. Writ large, it is the beloved community. Bell reminds us, quote, let's face it, wounded white people frequently can cover up their wounds because they have greater access to material power, end quote. Bell Hooks was a word warrior and a love warrior whose being was grounded by a deep ethical spiritual life. Her life was filled with self-interrogation, modes of painful honesty and truth telling. These were not abstract values for Bell, but everyday practices, which means that she did the work. I'll conclude with her words as they speak to how she saw her own work, her own daily practices. Again, this is from our interview, quote, I've been to the farmer's market. I've been to the church bazaar this morning. I really push myself to relate to people, that is, people that I might not feel as comfortable relating to. There are many Kentucky hillbilly white persons who look at me with contempt. They cannot turn me around. I am doing the same thing as those civil, right act, civil rights activists, those black folk and those white folk who sat in at those dinners, dinners or diners rather or maybe dinners too, and who in fact marched." End quote. Thank you very much. Wow, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Dr. Yancey. That was also amazing. And um, I'm so taken by um, what you said um, about Bell describing prayer as space for reckless abandonment. Um, and the way you talked about home um, really resonates. Um, but I think you're right that Bell truly is uh, the quintessential for this moment. Um, and I wonder um, if if maybe anybody would like to start us out with a question. Um, feel free to either put it in the chat or um, if you'd like to raise your hand, you can ask it for yourself. Um, but maybe while people are um, sort of collecting collecting their thoughts, I could I could begin with one, um, which is I guess that um, I think this really already began to come up in each of your um, presentations, but I, I'm really, I'm really curious about how you 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 see spirituality as this link for Bell between sort of the in individual, and um, the individual's potentials for collective action, um, and I I wonder um, how you think spirituality sort of helps mediate this tension between like in individuality and sort of self preservation, and also the need to participate in community um, and sort of. The collectivity that's also, you know, it's very religious and um, very spiritual, but also very political um, at the same time. Well, I guess I could just say that, you know, I think the self is what we have, right? So it's where we start. And, um, I think that 
both Christianity and Buddhism, what she saw in them was a kind of unselfing that allows you to be present for the neighbor, right? Um, I, I always tell this story. I had a graduate student one time who we were talking about um, the um, about the storage of, of on the road to, you know, in which the, the um, man stops and helps a man who's been hurt, you know, and, and he good said, Samaritan. the good Samaritan and G and he said, well, you know, Jesus never really tells us what the neighbor is. And I said, well, the story tells us what the neighbor is. <laughs> Open your, you know, read the story. And I thought, well, I think that's a kind of preservation of the self to even be able to say something like that. And so, you know, just to, to be really deeply interrogative about the self, um, which allows us to make the self present for others and recognize, you know, that, that we enter our, I mean, I think that's, um, that's really what love is all about. I think she nailed it in that sense. And it doesn't mean you need the community of people like yourself because you need refuge, but that allows you then to go out and address people who are not like you, who don't necessarily love you. And, and I think George is right. It's, the, it's, it's an image of King's beloved community. Um, so she's bringing all these strains forward that I think have been the, the underside of our culture that, that's generative, not destructive. Oh, thank, thanks for the hi. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. I was trying to speak earlier, but it said, as I was trying to unmute, it said, the host won't allow me in. <laughs> so, I thought that's not bell hooks like. <laughs> but, but right. I just want to, no, 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 I'm just kidding. But I couldn't get it. But, but I just want to add that I think, if you think about the term religion, it comes from religere, uh, which means to bind to, right? So if you think about that, there's a way in which Bell Hooks understands a religious life as binding us to the other, right? The stranger, uh, the one who is forlorn, the one who has been kicked out, the one who is marginalized, right? So it's a very, it's a very Christocentric perspective. Of course, she's grounded, grounded in that, right? Um, while at the same time, even though it's reaching toward the other and you're, you're bounded to and by the other, and there's this fundamental Levinasian responsibility for the other, at the same time, it doesn't, um, deteriorate or reduce to a kind of neoliberal atomic self, right? It's not this pre-social or asocial understanding of itself. It is regarding, regarding that, that binding, but at the same time, I think Bell is suggesting that in the process of giving oneself over to the other or answering to the other, there has to be also that practice of kenosis. And kenosis is that beautiful term for those who may or may not know it. Uh, it means to empty to self-empty. So I think there's a way in which she's looking at the relationship that we have with others and the demand of others upon us, while at the same time, so there's a Christocentric, while also this profound idea of kenosis, which I think is central to Buddhism and mindfulness, right? Of, of letting go, of emptying all of the sedimented practices, the racism, the sexism, you name it for her in terms of the multiple forms of, of, of hegemonic structures that are designed to kill and oppress us. So I think there's that combination for Bell in which she beautifully walks both Buddhism and, and Christianity. Yeah, I just wanna also add um, just a, a little tidbit from also um, just like my background in like social work and psychology, which I think um, is relevant to everything that um, has been said about her philosophy, about um, love, um, being a, a force of um, aiding in self-transformation, not only like consciousness, but like the actual like core of the self. Um, I think that the question of self-preservation is always one that comes up often when we're talking about trauma and we're talking about individuals who experience ongoing trauma every single day, right? in the form of sexism, racism, homophobia, and the like, the list goes on and on. And self-preservation um, is a natural psychological and biological instinct, 
we want to preserve the self and there's nothing wrong with wanting to preserve, to preserve the self. But what I find interesting in um, trauma studies is that in order for healing to take place, there has to be one, a testifier, somebody who, who is self-emptying, one who is practicing in this canonic self-emptying, who speaks to their experience of trauma. And there has to be a witness, which would be the other. The person who stands um, as the recipient of the gift of the self, that most vulnerable, broken aspects of who we are, right? So there is the testifier, the one who gives the testimony, and then there's the witness. And there are moments in our lives where we occupy one of those spaces and we occupy that other, but the, that's the two primary modes um, that are going to take place in the healing process. And what's interesting about this conversation about self-preservation is that healing is not possible until we occupy that space of testifying. We occupy that space of revealing to the other, the witness, those deep vulnerabilities, those deep wounds, those soul wounds, um, right? And so our healing is actually dependent upon the other because the other has to be a witness. It has to be a recipient of ourself. We're meant to give, give ourselves away in that, in that regard. And so while self-preservation is understandable, um, the irony is that in order to really preserve the self, you actually have to let the self go in order to experience that healing. And I think that, you know, speaking, you know, from, you know, a psychological so social work perspective, that's exactly what Bell is trying to teach us in the spiritual realm as well, that um, I, I was also just deeply moved and I want to jump to something somebody said. They're interested in hearing more about how to embrace anger, interrogate it, use it, make it compost. That was also something that like made me cry. You may have seen some tears being shed because I think one of the, one of the struggles I have um, in Christianity, which is actually something that is embraced in Buddhism, is this idea that suffering can be redemptive that this idea that we can turn anger into compost, I had never heard that before. And I just thought about my own, I guess, pile of shit in my life that hasn't been composted yet. And how do I turn it into, how do I turn it into compost? Cause it's just stinking up the yard right now, you guys. And I just really struggle with this idea. Like there are some materials that are not biodegradable. There are some things that can't be composted. And so I just, Bell is challenging me from beyond the grave in the ancestral realm. I'm like, Bell, I don't know. Like, there are some things that can't be composted. There are some things that can't, I don't know. Like, I'm just really wrestling with that as well, that can everything be turned into compost? Can everything be recycled and used for our liberation and our healing? Are there some things that are just gonna remain shit? I don't know. <laughs> you know, not to be provocative, but like Caroline, Dr. Yancey, I'm interested in what you have to say, but like that really challenged me. And I'm curious if everybody else in the audience is like, yes, like what do we do with it? I think there are some things that remain shit. Um, <laughs> my friend, uh, Claude on Shin Thomas, who's a Zen Buddhist monk, was in Vietnam as a young teenager. I won't tell his story, but I'll point to his story. Um, his, his, uh, and he was scarred so deeply, right? You know, he was a helicopter door gunner. He did things as a child. My husband did things in a tank that they'll never get over. And what, what Anj, Claude Anshin talks about is how he couldn't sleep at night because that was the time of anger and danger. And he said, so one night he's standing at the window looking out and realizing he couldn't sleep. And he said, he just sort of laughed. And he said, you're not going to sleep at night, kiddo. <laughs> That's the shit that can't be composted, right? But what you can, what he can do in terms of anger, he's taught me a lot. Bell Hooks has taught me a lot. 
is he says you just pause. And one way to process the anger is to stop the self for just enough time that you can see the other. And that potentially opens a space in which you can begin to make the compost together, right? But there's going to be stuff that you just never get over. I mean, I tell the story on my husband, his first confession after coming back from the Gulf War, he told the priest, bless me, Father, for I've sinned, I killed 99 people. <laughs> and he said, the priest sort of backed up, right? Like, oh, and who were these people? He said, well, I was in war. But you never get over that shit. I mean, you carry that your whole life. And he's, you know, somebody said word, amen. You know, it's the truth. But sometimes that shit is what informs you about what it means to be human, I think. I think that's what Bell Hooks points to. Yeah, I think um, I think what, what both of you are saying also just reminds me sometimes of the, the trouble with the term red, like redemptive or this instinct to sort of find the redemptive in everything can... Um, can, can do a real disservice to, as you say, the shit that can't be composted. Um, but um, also when you're speaking, Lewis, I was reminded so much of um, what um, Franz Fanon writes in Black Skin and White Masks about the sort of, um, the need for one's represent, to sort of recognize in the other, um, sort of a, a universality that also rec recognizes a sort of multiplicity of difference. And that in that difference, you can find um, something to sort of celebrate. Um, but you know, just with a couple of minutes left, I, I will point. I will turn to our, our final question um, from um, Michelle and Clyde, which is, um, who were wondering if each of the panelists could speak a little bit more personally about the meaning of bell hooks to them, as well as the impact of um, bell hooks loss. Um, maybe okay. that might be um, a good place to sort of wrap up, especially just noting the the, the day that we're gathering on. I'll, I'll jump in really quickly, but I have to I have to say something about shit too. So <laughs> very 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 quickly, um, I think I, it's getting es not eschatological, scatological. There's scatological, the yeah. Yeah, scatological. <laughs> not eschatological. Maybe eschatological too. So the one thing I want to say, I think that you know, uh, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois talked about race. No, yeah, Du Bois talked about racism, the end of racism, uh, being taking being involving a long siege, right? And you know, Martin Luther King talked about. Uh, who he quotes from someone who says that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends. Uh, I, I, right? Of course, it may not bend, and of course, the, the the universe may not be moral. Period. Right? We don't we don't know that. King King is very um, very embedded in Christian theology. Here. Fair enough. But I, but I think that uh, I think you're right. I think bell hooks would certainly understand the fact that the shit that we're faced with every day is powerful. It is almost uh, impregnable, immovable. Part of, the part of the problem here, of course, is time. We don't have enough time to undo, uh, to engage in kenosis where we empty all of that stuff out, right? So I think partly in understanding who we are as human beings faced with this is what is so important. And I think, I think it's, 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 in, it's in the capacity of others to bear witness to us in our tarrying, in our vulnerability, that I think where the redemption lies, right? And while redemption doesn't mean a total extrication out of the shit, it means being able to effectively tarry with the shit so that one continues to live a life that is generative, that one keeps an eye on the shit while at the same time keeping one's eye on the horizon, right? So I think that's what becomes existentially important. For Bell, for me, for you all who may not know, Bell and I used to sit around and have popcorn together. So that's the Bell Hooks I know, right? Uh, I've hung out with Bell Hooks and she's told me stuff, as I've said in, in an interview, that I would never disclose, right? So I've got like the juicy stories. Um, but, you know, she was a dear friend. She's someone that I could call. Like, just like that, I would give a call and she would answer the phone, right? I was giving a talk once in the UK and there were these, these um, UK black feminists who were talking about her work. I called her on the phone from the UK and she answered and these women were floored, right? Uh, and that was a little ego on my part, but that's the kind of person Belle went, meant to me. So 
for me, there is the death of Bell um, leaves us with a hole, um, vacuity that cannot be filled. So there is no filling that hole. But at the same time, I think she gives us a discursive framework, a spiritual framework, a poetic framework, uh, an existentially lived framework in terms of which we can strive uh, and engage in a constant process of self-interrogation and self-transformation. So to that extent, we keep her legacy alive to the extent that we continue to undo the world and to, and to remake the world uh, in a way that is predicated on something like profound love and spirituality. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Yancey. Um, Dr. jones or, or Larissa, do you have like any, maybe any final, any final thoughts? I did. No. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was gonna say, I can ha let you have the last word, Carolyn. I think, I could, I could share this brief, brief story. Um, I guess more like a, I guess, narrative of um, how life changing this woman's um, work on voicing was for me. Um, I was a person that always kept my head down until grad school. <laughs> um, I just was conditioned by a lot of life experiences. Um, racism, obviously being one of them, sexism, right? The like but other really traumatic things in my life to um, just always put others' needs before my own, you know, put your head down and survive. You know, that's typically the um, the black woman's experience, unfortunately, uh, as Zora Neale Hurston reminds us, we tend to be the mules of the world. Um, but one of, the, um, one of the things that was like literally changed my life, um, I took a womanist theology course at Candler. And we read um, a passage from Bell in one of our books about coming to voice, um, transitioning from object, objecthood to subjecthood. And I remembered um, this experience I had in South Africa. And specifically, I wanna, I'm reflecting on the line about rites of passage. I'm remembering this. And I was um, working in a village, a rural village, um, in a slum. And um, in a lot of African villages, they have what you call like the village mother, kind of like the black woman who, you know what I'm talking about, um, the woman who cares for the children and kind of, you know, make sure everybody's doing okay. Like she's just kind of like, you know, the mother of the village. And one of the, the village mothers invited me to dinner on the last evening of my trip. And I promise you, it, it, it almost sounds kind of fan, fantastical what I'm going to describe, but I just sense that she could see deeply into my being. She could see that wound of survival and that wound of never having been listened to or heard or, or considered. And before I left, she's like, I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to name you. I'm going to give you a Zulu name as a gift. And the Zulu name, I kid you not, was Tandeka, which is the Zulu word for a person who is loved. That changed my life. Mm. This woman did not know me. She didn't know anything about me. And she knew that I desired to be loved. I desired to be known. And that was the rite of passage that I had to take into my healing. And when I got back to Candler the following semester, we read Bell Hooks and I knew that's what she's talking about. I experienced that rite of passage with that woman who told me that I was loved, I'm not gonna cry, who told me that I was loved and I deserve to be on this earth as a black woman. It changed my life. And so I think that's the gift, right? The spirituality she's talking about. I just, and again, I, it just sounds so fantastical, like, but it happened. And 
um whew, yeah i know so, so someone's in the audience you know it's it's yeah, it's right. a beautiful gift and so i would say like um it was cool to see um the academic expression of an experience that i actually had in real life like a very uh, spiritual experience so i would say like bell gave me the courage to step into tandega that was not an identity i had before that trip I, I promise you, I was not. And that's what she means about the voice having to evolve. Tandeka was an evolution in my voicing. I was not Tandeka before South Africa, but I was after. Mm. And it was because she loved me. She loved me when no other, nobody else did. Mm. So I, I would say like, that's what I want to end with. Can I, can I jump in? I know it's yes. Over. Come on, come on, do it, girl. One, one, of, one of Bell's favorite books, of course, I think the favorite book is The Blue Sky by Toni Morrison. Mm. And what's interesting here in terms of what Larissa's saying is the, the protagonist, Pakola Breedlove, part of her problem, if not fundamentally her problem, is that she wasn't loved. In fact, there's no way that she even thought that she deserved to be loved because she was the ugliest, she was the, 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 the thing to, to be thrown around, kicked around, raped, brutalized, right? So what you're saying is really interesting in terms of your own experience in Africa, back to Bell Hooks, back to Pakola Breedlove, back to Bell's favorite text. And I think back to all of us, I think it's, it's important that all of us understand that we deserve to be loved, all of us. And if we're not getting that, then either we have to move out of the spaces we're not getting it, I think is very important because we have some agency there and find that community that's capable of affirming who we are, affirming us in our fragility, affirming us in our weakness, affirming us in our most desperate moments, right? I think that's the legacy of Bell Hooks. That's the love that she wants to give us. And I think that's the love that she continues to give us. Mm. Right. Mm. Well, I don't know what to say after all that because it's all right, but I guess just two quick things. One, um, I know she died of kidney disease and uh, my husband's a double transplant patient. So I have a sense of what her last days were like um, when you have no energy and all you can do is sit in one place. <laughs> now I'm gonna cry. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a way of being ill that, that forces one and the people around you as well into self-interrogation. Um, so that's the level on which I re-entered her work when I found out how she died. Um, I guess the other thing for me is that, um, and this is more in her poetry, she writes about Kentucky and being a mountain girl and that there she could be wild. And I think how many spaces do we get to be in when we can be wild? And how do you, you know, once you go into those spaces, the white supremacist, cis patriarchal spaces that are just trying to beat the wildness out of you, how do you get it back, you know? That's where I connect with her, coming from a segregated community myself in which I just remember in which going to school was such a trauma because I was encountering white folk and structures in a way that I had never had to encounter them before. And, what, and it was tying myself down. I always tell my students it's weird that I'm a professor because I've always hated school. Um, but I think what she inspired in me as a young doctoral student was there was another way to do school that you could get your wildness back. So I think for me, it's those two things. I know what her death was like and I hope her next birth is beautiful and I hope she can be wild. Thank you so much. Um, what a beautiful place to leave it. And thank you to each of our panelists for just such enriching and thought-provoking contributions. And 
Um, we're so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who attended as well. Um, what a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.